Welcome to Reading the Gospels Together for April the 8th. I'm joined by our special guest by popular demand, Ritter the Beagle. Today we're looking at Matthew chapters 17 and 18. And if you're looking for previous days, you can find them on the ZionPres.org website. Just click on the Reading the Gospels tab and it will take you to a list of all of our past videos. Chapter 17 has one of the great events of the life of Jesus, the Transfiguration. Peter has just figured out who Jesus is, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And now we get a glimpse of Jesus in his glory, shining with the very brightness of heaven. Not only that, he's joined by Moses and Elijah. Why them? Well, first of all, these two represent the totality of the Jewish faith and scriptures, which are often called the Law and the Prophets. Moses, the lawgiver and trusted by God with the Ten Commandments, represents the Law the system of conduct and ritual observance for the Hebrew people in right relationship to, with God, with the world, and with one another. Elijah represents the prophets, those speaking with the very voice of God, calling people to repentance, showing the path forward, proclaiming what was to come. In this tableau of Jesus, with Moses and Elijah speaking to him, the totality of the plan of God is standing right there. Jesus, the fulfillment of the law of the prophets, the Old Covenant and the New together. Peter, of course, puts his oar in. He's got a plan to memorialize this moment, but no sooner are the words out of his mouth than a voice comes from heaven, as at the baptism of Jesus. And now God speaks again. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And God says, listen to him. Or in other words, Peter, be quiet. Listen for a change. Listen to Jesus. But what has Jesus just been saying? That his path leads to Jerusalem, where he will be killed and raised to life. When Jesus had said this, Peter spoke up, No way, this will never happen to you. Peter, listen to Jesus. Peter, you see, would like to be in control. Peter would like to be making the plans for how his life, how everyone's life, even how Jesus' life would work out. But Peter isn't in control. Peter needs to listen. He needs to realize that victory for Jesus will come through loving self-sacrifice. Our lives must follow God's plan if we are to save our very souls. We need to listen to Jesus. Chapter 18 has so much. The value of children in the faith, what we can learn from them, how we should go to great efforts to ensure none of them are lost. Jesus also tells the famous parable of the lost sheep. The shepherd leaves the 99 and searches for the one who wandered away. Here's an insight to that parable. I was speaking with an actual shepherd, telling him that his flock reminded me of this parable, which I related to him. His response surprised me. A sheep like that will never be any good. It'll always be a pain in the neck. Let the wolves get him. Serves him right. That wasn't the response I expected. But it was a response that challenged me. I know that I'm less inclined to run after the problem people and bring them back into the fellowship of the church. Jesus has a different view, thank goodness. For Jesus, it is precisely these folks in our churches and in our personal lives for whom we must make the extra effort. And to illustrate that very point, Peter asks a difficult question. How many times do I need to forgive someone who wrongs me? Peter adds this, up to seven times? And Jesus responds, no, no, 77. What can this mean? Remember that forgiveness doesn't mean minimizing what happened or pretending it didn't happen or that whatever happened didn't matter. Were that the case, Jesus would have said, forget it, it doesn't matter. And there are things that happen between us and another person that fall into this category. No, we're talking here about something very real, something which mattered as the parable Jesus followed up with clearly shows. The king has forgiven his servant an enormous debt, the size of which could never be repaid. The servant, however, learns nothing from this. He demands repayment of his own minor loan from another, throwing him into prison when he can't repay. Here's a modern version of that very parable. There have been lots of headlines these days about major corporations paying their chief executives untold millions of dollars while at the same time demanding the government subsidize their business or they'll let their vulnerable workplace go. 
The public, quite rightly, is enraged by such stories. Jesus, as he often does, turns our outrage back upon ourselves. How much has God forgiven you? What was the price of that forgiveness? In light of that, how can you fail to forgive another? And not only because it's easy, but because it's hard. Don't you see that your own forgiveness becomes meaningless if you, in turn, do not extend that forgiveness to others? N.T. Wright says, if you're still counting how many times you've forgiven someone, you're not really forgiving them at all, but simply postponing revenge. It's up to us to initiate the process of reconciliation with those who've wronged us and start the process of healing, and to never give up. Continuing to carry a grudge will hurt only us and cause us to live with the burden of unresolved conflict and hurt. Tomorrow, chapters 19 and 20. Some difficult things here as well. Divorce and wealth. Jesus is dealing with the big issues now. There's also a baffling parable about workers in the vineyard. What do you make of that one? I'll see you tomorrow. Also, this is Holy Week. Tune in on Friday for the Stations of the Cross. We'll be providing links to the 2019 service, which was tremendously moving. Don't miss it. And so now, from Ritter the Wonder Beagle and myself, have a wonderful, wonderful day. And if you've got one, walk your dog.